All right. All right, on, uh, on Friday we were working on a problem where we were looking at uh, beam deflection. Did uh, anybody skip Easter dinner and work through that problem? Do you have an excuse because it wouldn't load for you? So we had this problem of a uniform, uniformly, well not uniformly distributed, a distributed load, something like that. I think it was an eight foot beam. No, it was just an L length beam. And uh, the maximum load went up to some some uh, load. Remember that's that's load per linear foot. Uh, so it, it got up to that. And we were looking for the deflection. Remember that business? Uh, we had uh, we had four, or well, we had five equations, but they're all related to each other. They were all either differentials of each other or integrals of each other, depending on which way you went through the list, but they're all very closely related. And from that, we were getting uh, what we're looking uh, for, which is some function that describes the amount of deflection as a function of position on the beam, so that we could uh, accurately predict just where that beam is going to be once it's loaded. So we started, we started that problem, right, on Friday. What was the, I think we had the first step set up, but just didn't quite get anywhere with it. What did we do first, remember? Uh, an option of loads. Uh, and what were we going to do with that? Uh, looks like we integrated it to get the shear. Yeah, that the remember we have this one relation where the load function gives us the negative slope of the shear curve, and then we uh, we knew that we could integrate or take the derivative of whatever whichever direction we needed to go to get back to this load curve idea. So we had that little bit. Um, and we can now find the shear from that. Uh, how do we want to do it? I guess uh, um, actually that will give us delta v one the change in the in the shear as we integrate through that. Okay, so we were we were set up for those uh, those pieces there. Actually, it won't be delta V because we have a, an indefinite integral, so we're okay. All right, what was the equation then for the load curve? Remember, we because of symmetry, we only need to do it to halfway. So there's no sense going across the whole thing, especially since we can't get a single function for it. Yeah, so this actually needs to also be L over 2 because of that. What was the uh, the function that describes this? We had that, right? It's 0 here. If we take the intercept there, all we need then is the slope. The slope is the rise over the run, which is L over 2. So that function is uh, that slope times x. So that's what we can integrate then. Oh man. We do these as indefinite integrals. Um, because uh, we'll, we'll use the constant integration to establish these things. All right. So, integrate that real quick. Let's 
see, uh, increase the power by one, bring down the power, and then we'll have a constant of integration as well, right? How do we get rid of the constants of integration, remember? By the way, Doobie, maybe I'll, I'll, I just remember you weren't here, so let me help what we're doing here. We're looking for this function of the deflection. Uh, the, the shear, or uh, the, the derivative of that, is the slope is the angle uh, that the beam itself will take at any position for very small angles because the tangent is equal to the uh, angle itself that's done in radians for very small angles. If we take the derivative of that again, we get, remember, Come on, you guys were here. What did you say? <laughs> well, Lee, thanks for at least asking that. If, if we take the derivative again, we get not quite the moment. Remember, there's another term in there. Or there actually, two terms. Remember, it has EI in there. Uh, by the way, that, that, that together is called the flexural rigidity, which is a pretty cool term if you think about it. It's a kind, kind of like jumbo shrimp. Flexural rigidity. Um, now if we derivate this again, Then we get the shear, and if we do it once more, then we get the load curve. I mean, yeah, the load curve itself. And so that's where we are on this problem. We're starting from there. So that's what we came up with on, on Friday. Alright, so we did this in def definite integral, gave us a constant of integration, that gives us the shear based on the load curve, but it's got this constant of integration in there. Remember how we get rid of those? With boundary conditions. Do we have any boundary condition for the shear that we could use? In fact, let's think uh, what our boundary conditions could be. We're going to in integrate, let's see, uh, one, two, three, four times. So we suspect we'll have four constants of integration. We'll need four boundary conditions. What are they? You don't need to look in your book, Jake. Look at the curve. Are there any places where we know something about the displacement, angle, moment, shear, or, well, we can't use the load because that's, that's uh, uh, we don't have a, a constant integration on the load curve itself. Jake? Oh, uh, x equals zero, the moment's because of the pin support at x equals zero, the moment is zero. So we'll be able to use that on the next integration. Does the theta equal zero there as well? No, theta won't equal zero there because there's clearly some angular defect deflection right there at that point. Only on cantilever is zero? 
yeah, uh, a cantilever support because we expect once it's loaded that its deflection will be something like that so that this angle and the, the slope there is zero. Jake? At, um, L over 2 would be to be 0? Because of the symmetry condition, we know that these two curves have to match each other and have a continuous slope. That's, that's one thing that's definitely true of these beams. These beams cannot deflect such that there's any sharp angles in uh, angle that the, the slope cannot be discontinuous because uh, uh, no beam's going to bend that way. These are, are elastic solids. They'll bend in nice continuous curves. So at the intercept, uh, at the intersection of the two symmetry halves, we do know then that the slope there will be zero. So we'll be able to use that on that integration. What else? There's two others. And we've got to figure, uh, it's got to be one on the shear so we can get the constant integration at the shear level. And we haven't used this level yet either. So is there any boundary condition on the deflection or displacement itself? Is that shear constant throughout the entire first half of the beam? Is that helpful? Uh, is the shear constant? Remember the shear, uh, the low curve is the slope, and the slope is, is uh, I mean, the uh, uh, slope of the shear curve. The load curve is constantly changing, so the slope is going to constantly be changing. Zero, what? Zero. what is zero? Zero. Is it? Well, let's sketch the shear curve. We know we're going to have symmetric supports there of how big each support's got to hold half the load the total load there is the area under so each each reaction is one half the total area or, or the area of just one side which is Omega is zero L over four, isn't it? So the so the shear is going to start there. Omega is zero L over four, and then do what? Well, this is the slope of the shear curve. Starts at zero and gets increasingly greater to a maximum. So the shear curve is going to do, starts at zero and gets increasingly bigger. Shear curve is going to do something like that. Does that seem reasonable? Actually, no, that's not going to work. What is it going to do? It's going to reach a maximum, and then so so it's going to go like that. No, that doesn't make sense either. Because, because we need to finish down here at W0 L over 4, don't we? So what, what's going to happen with it? Well, at least we know what the shear is going to be at x equals 0. Then the slope gets less and less and less until it hits 0. But there's no discontinuity. 
So, how does this work? Yeah. We may have to actually calculate. Is this right? Starts at zero. Oh, there's a problem. again to get back to the moment. So it integrates again to uh, W0x cubed over 3L plus C1, which I already know. X plus C2 now. C1 I know, I'm just leaving it in there for convenience. It's just easier to write it that way. And we know at x equals 0, the moment is 0. So, um, so that's 0, that's 0, and so C2 equals 0. That's good, so we're done with that one. Yeah, C2 equals zero. We integrate again to get to the angle, and that's good, because we have that. Uh, boundary condition. C1 in there, C2 is out. Now we'll have C3. And we know that's zero at L over two. So using our, our second boundary condition. All right, that one's a little more involved, so I'll give you that one. C3 is then, once you put x equals L over 2 and theta equals 0 for the second boundary condition, you get C3 equals 5W0L Q over 192. And remember, each of these pieces here 
have to have the same units. So uh, you can watch how the uh, L over 2s and everything all accumulate. it once more, that gets us then to the deflection curve that we were looking for, minus W0x now to the fifth over 60L. Plus C1, which is W0L over 4. There's a 2 down there already. So that's 8. Oh no. We're integrating it all. So we have x cubed over 24. Is that right? This, this C1 becomes x cubed over 6. But C1 is w0 over 4, so it's 24. Units of Newton. Okay, so they're working. C2 is missing. C3 is that, and we integrated once more, so it'll have an X on it. Plus one last, uh, one last constant of integration. <clears throat> I think that's right. Let's have a 50 x 3 cubed over no, 24. Cubed. Yeah, 5 over 190. Yeah. Sorry? Is that all cubed? Uh, well, we've got uh, meters to the fifth over meters. That's meters to the fourth. Meters to the fourth. Meters... Yeah, that's LQ. That one's LQ. Uh, uh, on the L, right? Or on the X. Wait, why is that one not, not, not LQ? I uh, mean, sorry, not XQ. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry, it's right there. I just didn't write it down. Okay, LQ. Yeah, so each of them have units of that part of meters to the fourth. All right, so what about this last constant of integration? We need something on the deflection itself. Sorry? We got plug in the third condition that? No, we already used that. <coughs> we use that here. We can only use the boundary condition once. Because uh, it's it's essentially these are four unknowns. We need four equations. You can't use one of the equations twice. They, Deflection zero at x equals zero? Of course. At x equals zero, the beam is fully supported. So this deflection is zero. So that's zero when x, x, x equals zero. So C4 is itself zero. And so then we have the shear curve itself, which we can clean up a little bit if you want. W0x. These polynomials are all um, a part of whatever they are. Oh, we've got the EI all the way through there. So.
plus minus 25 L. So now the, the uh, deflection of the beam can be calculated at any place along the length of the beam. What is the PI again? What is that blue? The, that's the flexural rigidity. It's the, it's, it's essentially the beam is already chosen for you when you have that number. Because you know E from the material, remember that's the uh, uh, Young's modulus, and I is the cross-sectional uh, moment of inertia of the beam. So essentially what that's saying is you already have the beam chosen. You know the material and you know the uh, moment of inertia of the beam. If you don't have the beam chosen, you have to choose it such that uh, those are still uh, useful. You know, if you have a, a minimum deflection you can withstand, then you can choose EI, or you can calculate EI uh, for any point along the beam. All right, so that's the end of Friday's problem. Still got to think of what that shear curve is going to look like. <coughs> Why is the EI on that side of the equation? Shouldn't it be on the other side? No, we'll, when we divide through by EI, it comes down here just oh, like okay. it is there. Okay, another method, remember this works for relatively simple curves, load curves if you've got them, or fairly straightforward things. Remember a lot of these are in the table in the book. In fact, was that one? Remember we have this table, page. Where were our load curve tables? I think they're right after the, yeah, page 808 in, uh, in the 8th edition. Our load curves, and we have, uh, we don't have that, that one in there. Be careful. The uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6th one on the table looks kind of like it, but isn't quite. So the question becomes, is there some way to use the tables for those types of problems that aren't in the table? For example, a relatively straightforward problem. where we have a uniformly distributed load, which could be the weight of the beam itself. If we were looking at the weight of the beam in the problem, it would look, uh, it would be a load just like that. But then also imagine at the one quarter point, we also have a point load, maybe uh, to represent that there's a, a wall or some kind of load bearing partition right there. This particular problem is not in the tables. So, uh, so this distance is two meters. This is 20 kilonewtons per meter. We'll take this to be 150 kilonewtons. So the total of those two loads is comparable. Um, each is going to have a significant contribution to the, the bending. And we'd expect it to be a little bit lopsided because of that 
uh, asymmetric loading. So we figure it's going to be something like that, and we need to find that curve. If you look in table appendix C, you see it's not there. That particular type of loading isn't there. However, it is made up of two loads that are there. So we can break it into those two loads. that are in the table. That load is in the table. That's the, uh, the fourth one down in Appendix C. We'll add together the other load that is also in the table in a method called superposition. Let's, uh, let's call this one C4. It's Appendix C, uh, Sample 4. We'll call this one C2. It's the second one in the table. Notice the, the first one in the table is a symmetric point load, so that doesn't match. Um, so be very careful of using the right load here. Also, we're going to have a, a, another fairly serious precaution in a second. So, so for the, the uniformly distributed load, notice it gives you the load curve already integrated for you. Minus WX over 24. I what else? X cubed minus 2LX squared. So this is the uniform load C4 already done. All the constants of integration figured out based on the available boundary conditions. And so that's the deflection uh, already given there. And it's a matter of just filling in constants that we've got. We know that the load is 20 kilonewtons per meter. Uh, I'll give you an EI, 100 mega newton meters squared. So we've got that. L is, of course, the length of the beam, 8 meters. And what? That's all we need. So for that particular deflection, then, this whole thing reduces to minus 8.33 times 10 to the minus 6. The minus means it's deflection down. They aren't always. There are certain bending uh, moments that could cause a deflection up. X times X cubed minus 16 X squared. All this is is just putting in the known constants and simplifying a bit. making sure the units work. This is in mega newtons. The W load is in kilonewtons, so you have to watch your units. And this will give a deflection then in meters. And 
as you'd expect. And if you graph this, you'll find, of course, it's symmetric, as it should be. It's a symmetric load, so you get a symmetric deflection. <coughs> All right, that's the easy one. C2 is a little more difficult. Not, not more difficult, a little trickier. It's V equals minus P. That's, that's whatever this particular load is, P x over 48ei. Remember, this is just the integration already done for you with the constants of integration evaluated. <clears throat> 3L squared. Oh, wait. Sorry, I slipped one line. That's the line above. 6 EIL. Yeah, there's a B. I was looking at the one above it, I think. Let's see, what's B? B is the distance after, and A is the distance before the load has drawn. Sorry? No, write it down just like it is in the book. L squared minus B squared minus X squared. Did I get that one right now? But that's not all that's listed there. What also is listed there? What? The domain for x. This is good for 0 to a only. It's only good for this portion of the beam. To do the other portion of the beam, you uh, essentially just have to turn it around and do it from the other side, and the equations will match. fairly easy to do uh, if you're careful with it, easy to do on a spreadsheet. So go ahead and evaluate from 0 to A and then do the uh, back part. And uh, then you'll have the whole curve. Essentially, the three 
curve because we're going to add these two curves together. It's very easy to do in a spreadsheet. You can do it by adding the polynomials too, but it just gets to be a mess in algebra. Yeah. 
it's easier to do it on the spreadsheet because you can use a different column for X for the, the two and then graph them together. And I'll show you that in a second. Foot or any drug? Uh, no? Just sprained it? Yeah. Boring. You didn't even cut it? No. The brood? That's probably pretty purple. Uh, I don't know. That's, uh, we'll take it off. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> So this first one becomes minus 187.5 when all the numbers are put together times 10 to the 6th. Sorry, minus 6th. X, 28 minus X squared. And then the second one, you have to graph from the opposite side. And the other one you have to graph. Does anybody have the second one? Yep. So we could call this uh, L and call this an R. Then what? The rest, the rest is the same. Same as that? I didn't get it quite. 16. 16 minus x squared. Yeah, 60 minus x squared. And that's from the right. And if you graph those each independently, they do join up nicely as you'd want. They have to join up. something like that. They have to join up both uh, by deflection because we can't have a step jump in the deflection itself. But we can't have a step jump in the, in the slope either. So they have to match. I'm not sure what the two of them do, but right there they have to have the same slope and the same deflection so that the two curves match. And when you do that, when you graph the two, uh, <clears throat> this easy one, the symmetric one there is C4, and it's nice and symmetric as it looks. The point of the load is right in about in here somewhere. Notice how the blue curve, C2, does match nicely in both slope and absolute deflection where the two curves come together. I graph the left-hand curve on one side and then the right-hand curve coming from the other. The two of them together give the total deflection added together. Of course, it's greatly exaggerated, but you see that the maximum deflection is going to be about, what, about 22 millimeters over an eight meter beam, about a 24 foot beam, maybe about the size of this room, and you're going to have a deflection of almost an inch, which is certainly enough for other parts of the building does not fit if, uh, if you don't account for that deflection, if you don't have some kind of, some kind of uh, flexibility built into the design itself. Okay, that's it. We'll do uh, a couple more superposition problems uh, tomorrow.